Well, a very good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Craig Martin. I'm the chairman of Dynam Capital, the fund manager for Vietnam Holding. And I'm joined today by, by my colleagues Tan and Tin. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, many thanks to people who uh, attended the AGM just held uh, earlier this morning. And today we'd like to take the opportunity to take you through the key results of the financial year that ended 30th of June, as well as give uh, an outlook on how Vietnam is looking at the moment and the prospects for the rest of this year, and also a glimpse into next year as well. So last September, uh, the fund held a very successful tender offer for 30% of its shares and returned just under 57 million US dollars to shareholders that participated in the tender. And during the year that ended on 30th of June, the net asset value per share in US dollar terms fell by 4.2% and in sterling terms rose by 9%. During the year, the fund shares, which are traded on the main board of the London Stock Exchange, rose by 16.7%. And the discount between the share price and the net asset value narrowed from just over 20% to slightly under 15%. The fund has outperformed the Vietnam All Share Index on a one, three, five, and a 10 year basis. Over 10 years, it's delivered a compound return of just over 16% uh, versus the Vietnam All Share Index return of 13.4%. As a manager, we've built uh, for the fund an actively managed high conviction portfolio and we're nimble in our stock selection and our construction of the portfolio. And for many years, we've integrated strong environmental and social governance principles into everything that we do. So the fund is quite concentrated. It has 24 holdings at the end of June with the largest holding now around about 12%. The top 10 holdings account for almost two thirds of the portfolio, and there's no gearing in the company or in, in the investment trust. We measure the estimated carbon footprint of the portfolio, and it's more than 60% lower than the Vietnam index. The fund was also very early signatory of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing, or PRI, and in last year's transparency report, which was just released, we scored uh, two five stars in their PRI reporting. The fund is invested across the key themes that come out of Vietnam's attractive macro, which we'll talk to you, to you in a minute about. And we're an active investor and nimble across the company size. We can invest in small cap, mid cap, and large cap. Next slide. We try and do simple things well. Our strategy focus is really around finding good growth at a reasonable price. And we're looking for businesses that can compound their earnings uh, by around 20% per annum. We want to find good management teams, strong defensive balance sheets, and uh, category champions. On a growth perspective, we're looking at this year kind of ending up around about 20% uh, EPS growth. Uh, maybe next year, looking ahead, possibly uh, slightly lower at maybe 10 to 15% EPS growth. But in terms of our fund, uh, we think that we can actually uh, deliver a higher growth. An evaluation for the market on a forward basis for this year is single digits, around about nine times. So we think it's good growth prospects at attractive valuation. Next slide. Vietnam is well positioned. Uh, at the junction of Southeast and Northeast Asia. It's a large country, a young population, increasingly digitally connect connected. There are more than 72 million smartphones in Vietnam. And e-commerce is growing at one of the highest rates in Asia, around about 30% per annum. Today, the urbanization level in Vietnam is still relatively low at 37%. That's where Western Europe was after the Second World War, but it's rapidly increasing. It's a highly literate and a hardworking population. The macro is attractive. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about the strong 
levels of GDP growth, which over uh, the last 30 years have averaged uh, around about 6.7%, and how the country's attracted high levels of foreign direct investment and positioned itself as a very open economy, a key part of the world's supply chain, with its trade uh, representing more than 200% of GDP. It's also a consumer market, and the per capita GDP has passed the $3,000 level, which is normally an inflection point in the growth of a domestic consumer market. And Vietnam's been a key exporter of many se segments over a number of years, but is increasingly moving up the value chain. So if you go into your uh, uh, wardrobe, you'll see a lot of made in Vietnam on your clothes and on your running shoes, but also in terms of uh, software and, and hardware, uh, Apple devices and Samsung devices, uh, many of those are made in Vietnam. Next slide. I'll head over to Tan, who will walk us through some of the key macro points. Yes. So after more than three, three decades of growth, now is, uh, the economy of Vietnam has become sizable and it offers a number of very good investment opportunities, especially in key themes that the fund has been following, including the, the real estate, the industrial uh, services, in the theme of urbanization and industrialization. With the urbanization of only 38% and rapidly increase, so it creates a lot of opportunities. Beside that, Vietnam is in an inflection point in growth with GDP, growth per, GDP per capita of more than $3,000 per, per capita. So the consumption is the key growth of Vietnam. Uh, in the next decade. Next slide. With the sizable GDP uh, in value, more than $500 million, and the 7% growth of the GDP would be very sizable and it create a lot of opportunities. After the, during the COVID, Vietnam still managed to have positive GDP growth and outperform its peer in the region. And we expect that Vietnam could back to the, the long-term level of GDP growth of 6.5% next year. And this year would be very outstanding of about 8.5% of GDP growth. Next slide. The key growth driver of Vietnam, including the consumption, uh, sizable consumption market, the public investment disbursement with which is um, supported by the government, the commitment of the government to disburse more public investment to quickly revive the economy. The export sectors also very, and the export growth of Vietnam is still intact. And also the strong uh, balance sheet of Vietnam, so the strong banking sector could help and support Vietnam to, to cushion the, the, the harmful impact of the global slowdown to quickly recover after the COVID and now uh, uh, during the slowdown of the global economy. We, are, we will talk more about the external risk and how Vietnam could, could overcome and to, to continue to grow in the next five years. Next slide. Back to uh, one of the key role driver in Vietnam in uh, the last five years, either FDI. And after the the pandemic, and even during the, the, the slowdown of the economy, Vietnam continued to attract more FDI inflow because of the strategic location of Vietnam in a very dynamic economic area. We have a strong relationship with China, with South Korea, with Japan, and in the heart of ASEAN, and it could create Vietnam uh, put Vietnam in a vital position to continue to grow despite the slowdown of many partners. And the young population of Vietnam, also the high, very high uh, employment to population ratio could support, continue to support Vietnam and help Vietnam to be more resilient during the, the slowdown of the global export sector. Next slide. Vietnam continued to follow 
its policy of reopening the economy. And Vietnam has been signed a number of very important bilateral and multilateral agreements, especially for the EV FTA, the UK V FTA, and also the ASEAN. So it would help Vietnam connect more to the world and to cushion the slowdown of any area because of a, a, a well-diversified foreign trade partner of Vietnam. Next slide. The middle, um, uh, the middle class population in Vietnam should increase a lot. As I already mentioned, the inflection point in growth of the GDP per capita of $3,000 per capita. It would help Vietnam to grow despite uh, the, 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 the key role driver of export, the FDI, could slow down in the next few decades. Then we will have the more important key growth drivers is the consumption market. Yeah, next slide. Just a few key indicators of Vietnam, macro, macroeconomic indicator of Vietnam after the COVID. The retail sales of Vietnam has been recovered strongly. And year to date, the retail sales achieve a surprisingly uh, numbers of more than 20%. And the manufacturing sector also quickly uh, recovered the PMI of more than 50, 51, and still in an expansion territory. We saw the commitment of many multinational corporations, especially uh, from traditional um, trade, par uh, uh, trade partners from Korea, from Japan, to continue to expand their capacity, uh, their footprint in Vietnam, including the Apple, LG, Samsung, strong commitment. And we, we, don't, uh, we expect the, the sustainable uh, inflow of the FDI in this year and the next few years. Next slide. Uh, in terms of export growth, yeah, very surprising. We can still maintain the export, high export growth to all partners, including US, China, Korea, Japan, and even EU. We, uh, we think that next year, the, the export growth could slow down yeah, due to the, uh, the slowdown of the whole economy, the global economy. But it would be more, more resilient for Vietnam. The, uh, the EU, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the euro weaknesses has have been uh, posed some risk for Vietnam. But I will talk more later about how Vietnam, uh, the currency of Vietnam could be more resilient and could be overcome well in, in a very volatile FX global market. Next slide. Vietnam has been doing business with many partners. Yeah, we are more with China, US, Korea, Japan, and we import uh, from China with the currency de depreciated against US dollar and export to US. We have good relationship with Korea, Japan, and the movement of the currency actually uh, support Vietnam. On the year euro, with the depreciation of more than 14% year to date, could pose some, some risk, but the, the risk is under control. And with the um, stable monetary policy, the fiscal policy of Vietnam, the, the, the level of foreign debt of Vietnam has been under control for the last few years. It's not a big concern for Vietnam uh, anymore. The foreign debt is about 38% uh, of GDP. And you see under control, uh, under control. So the, we have seen the increasing pressure for the currency, but it's still under control. Next slide. Just uh, another point for the FX risk of, uh, of Vietnam. Uh, due to the, uh, the and very volatile movement of the uh, many currencies uh, in, in the F global FX market. 
the uh, the central bank of Vietnam also have to intervene in the IMAX market to stabilize the currency. And year to date, they already sell around $20 billion to stabilize the currency. Uh, and we don't think this uh, it, 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 the, the trend forever that could like, uh, like, like harm the, uh, the reserve of Vietnam because of this sustainable FDI inflow, the trade, uh, the trade surplus uh, of Vietnam and also the healthy balance sheet of, uh, of the economy. But in the short term, they have to do so to stabilize the currency. For the longer term, we believe that the currency of Vietnam could be more resilient compared to, the, to, to its peers, like we, have, we see uh, in the chart on the right. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, the, uh, another concern uh, recently that we are all talking about is the inflation. But not like in the West, the inflation in Vietnam surprisingly under control because of a few, um, a few reasons. The first one is Vietnam doesn't consume a lot of energy, uh, like for the heating, uh, like in the West. So we don't consume uh, natural gas for heating, but just, just mainly for electricity production. Uh, but the source of electricity of Vietnam has been very balanced over the last few decades. From hydro, from gas fire, from renewable and from coal, and most of them, we can sell supply. Only about 20% of the, the coal we have to import. So that pretty much help control the inflation. And Vietnam even have to import net is a, is a net import crude oil, but the level is, is very quite minimal. And the, 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 high, uh, the high price of the crude oil cannot have a big impact on the inflation of Vietnam. Next slide. Yes, just a very quick look on how uh, uh, the inflation of Vietnam next year we compare to, uh, to the basket of C CBI of the US. So you can see that the key driver of the CPI of Vietnam is the, the food at home because we don't consume a lot of like pork and the, pri the price of pork is increased, increased a lot last year and the year before because of the ASEAN African swan flu. But the pandemic already gone and the supply of the, the pork has increased a lot after the pandemic. It could help Vietnam. Uh, it could help uh, cause, uh, reduce the pressure on the inflation of Vietnam. So this year, we expect that the inflation could be below 4%. And next year, could be around 4 to 5%, even with the current uh, high price of gas and also uh, the crude oil. Yeah, next slide. Yes, so the key concern uh, of the economy at the moment, including the inflation, including the interest rate, including the FX risk. Yes, we believe that the, the, the pressure is, is still there, but the situation of Vietnam is, is much better than uh, uh, many areas in, in the world. Yeah, next slide. We believe that during the very tough time, like, like, uh, like right now, there's a lot of opportunities. And uh, as a fund manager, our duty is to, uh, to find those opportunities during the crisis. So next slide. The valuation of the equity market in Vietnam is as, at historic recall low. Uh, and now the trailing PE of the, the market is, is just around eight to nine times of trailing PE. And we still expect that the EPS growth, the earning growth of the whole market is still about 10 to 15% for next year. Next slide. Yes, we also uh, compare the profitability 
of the Vietnam market to, to its peer. And Vietnam is still outstanding compared to its peers. The profitability, the return on equity, 16%. It's quite strong and outstanding. And the variation is still trading at below 10 times of trading P. And the price to book about 1.6. Yeah. Next slide. A longer term, a longer story of Vietnam is the inclusion of Vietnam market into the MSCI Emerging Market Index. At the moment, Vietnam is the very big participant, big member in the MSCI Frontier Market. Is now people are already consider Vietnam as an uh, emerging market uh, member. Uh, so the inclusion of Vietnam into the MSCI uh, index, emerging market index, could attract a lot of inflow into Vietnam, and it could. And the quick consequences of the inclusion is the is the re-rating of the valuation of the Vietnam market, and we believe that. With the KPI set by the government of Vietnam, by the National Assembly of Vietnam, the inclusion of Vietnam into the index is one of the KPIs. And we expect that Vietnam could be included by 2025. Next, next slide. Yes, and now to meet the KPI, the government, the Ministry of Finance has been doing a lot of things to solve the key impediment. The first one is FOM. Yeah, foreign ownership limit. And they have put a lot of solutions in, in the law on security already effective last year. They have been also talking about NV, uh, uh, NVDR uh, and also talking a lot about the capital control and also upgrade the system and also provide an, uh, the, the uh, more regulation in terms of information transparency and also protect the minor investors and also foreign investors. So there's a lot of progress has been doing, has been done. Uh, and we expect that by the end of this year or early next year, the new trading system will be put into operation and would also uh, one, uh, one of the, uh, in, in the agenda of the government to, to, to meet the KPI. Yeah, next slide. Yes, uh, so uh, besides the upgrade of the system, besides uh, um, many solutions for, for Vietnam to be included in the MSCI, a lot of uh, development uh, of the market also have been, uh, have been uh, recorded, including the uh, introduction of the futures, warrants, uh, the development of the bond market, and also the bond futures have been introduced. And, um, uh, many ETFs, uh, so uh, there's a lot of charges uh, for foreign investors. Uh, we uh, acknowledge that there's a lot of a lot of things to uh, have to be done uh, uh, by 2025, uh, but there's a lot of progress has been made. Yeah, next slide. And now I would like to hand over to uh, to 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 Craig talk more about the portfolio. Uh, thank you, Tan. Next slide. So we try and do simple things well. Our team on the ground in Vietnam is able to research and select and recommend good stocks, combining both a strong uh, top-down as well as a bottom-up approach. For more than 10 years, the fund has been a signatory to the United Nations principles for responsible investing. And what we deliver on that mandate is really a very authentic engagement with our portfolio companies, which is one of the reasons that the portfolio is quite concentrated. We know our businesses well, I meet regularly uh, with the management teams of those companies to check in on how they're delivering on their mandates and how they're looking to improve their own ESG and reporting practices. It's a very active portfolio. We're not tied to an index, we report against an index, but we're trying to really generate good returns um, at attractive valuations in terms of the stocks that we buy into. But we're a, a long-term investor. We're long only uh, buying good companies, uh, monitoring those companies' development, 
and being an active and a nimble investment manager. Next slide. So Tan gave you a good description of, of the macro environment in Vietnam, which is very supportive to the growth in the domestic consumer. It's also very supportive to the growth in urbanization and industrialization. That's the linkages that support the made in Vietnam, Vietnam's strong export position. So in our portfolio, we have a number of companies that are category champions in several of these sections. Our number one position, FPT, is a digital champion. Over the last five years, its return on equity has averaged about 35%. And it's been growing its top line and its bottom line by about 30%, providing strong domestic as well as international IT services and education as well. We have a couple of strong category killers as well in retail, Mobile World, an omni-channel champion, and Funan Jewelry, which is a... Uh, a fast growing, rapidly growing retail jewelry business. Its retail growth is actually higher now than it was pre-pandemic. So these businesses are playing into the, the growth and the growing disposable consumer income, as well as the trends to modern retail, which is growing rapidly in Vietnam. Many of the segments in Vietnam are also underpinned by a strong banking system. And we have a number of good quality banks in the portfolio. We're underweight if you compare ourselves to the index, uh, but we have uh, made tremendous uh, profits over the last few years in the banking sector, and we may allocate more to it going forward because uh, the good bank stocks have been sold off uh, alongside the weaker banks and their attractive levels of valuation. And we're also uh, underweight the real estate segment in Vietnam. And in real estate, we're allocate both, allocated both to retail uh, real estate, that's uh, condominiums and uh, gated housing, as well as industrial parks. These are the industrial clusters that the manufacturers that Tan alluded to are coming to. And so there's uh, two different uh, components there to the, the, the real estate opportunity that we're looking at. But it's a concentrated portfolio, two thirds in the top 10. And we derive our alpha both through our, our portfolio, our stock selection uh, and our weightings around that. At the moment, we have a relatively high amount of cash, normally would be perhaps two to 3%, uh, but we've been cautious during what has been a very volatile period uh, in recent uh, weeks and months. And so we have a reason reasonable amount of cash that we could look to deploy in the future at undemanding valuations into companies that we know really well. Next slide. We're an active investor, but we're also nimble across the company size. Many of our portfolio companies are now large cap, that's over a billion dollars in market cap in the way that we measure it. But they started off as smaller mid cap when we first invested in them, but they've been compounding their earnings at 20 to 30 percent over five to 10 years. So we're able to look at early small stage companies, perhaps with very few external investors, but we're also able to invest and manage in the mid cap as well as the large cap opportunities that we see as attractive in Vietnam. Next slide. We've demonstrated outperformance, not only against the, the Vietnam index, the Vietnam All Share Index, but also against the broader MSCI, both the emerging market as well as the frontier index, and against the broader FTSE All Share on a one and a three year basis, but also on a five and a 10 year basis as well. Next slide. So strong long-term outperformance. So we think Vietnam is both an opportunity to find alpha, uh, but also to get some diversification. The Vietnam market has a relatively low level of correlation between the global equity markets and also the emerging markets. It's less than 0.4 uh, in terms of correlation. So it's both outperformance as well as diversification. And we're pleased that Vietnam Holding has also outperformed the index as well. So good alpha. Next slide. So just a little bit on Dynam Capital, the fund manager uh, for Vietnam Holding. We're focused. All we do is invest in, in Vietnamese equities. And we're a, a closely knit, knit team um, to serve our clients' interests. Next slide. 
We take responsible investing seriously. We've been doing it for a very long time. As we've said, one of the earliest signatories of United Nations principles, responsible investing. We think the ESG helps us filter uh, the opportunity. There's more than 1,600 listed companies in Vietnam, and we've got a portfolio of 25. So we use ESG as a tool in our stock selection. But it's also a tool that when we're engaging with our companies, uh, we get to use as a risk mitigant if things are not going so well with some of our portfolio companies uh, or if they're failing to continue the journey that they've started. So it's both the selection tool for us as well as providing downside protection in terms of uh, risk management. We're also an advocate. So we're involved in several uh, organizations uh, and Tin uh, co-founded the Vietnam Institute of Directors and is a leading voice in corporate governance in Vietnam. And we're also uh, part of several regional groups around good governance and also adherence to climate reporting and climate action. Next slide. So in summary uh, of all that Tan and I have been talking to you about, we think Vietnam's a market that offers good diversification, good growth, cheap valuations, and a very strong macro uh, economy, despite all the weakness globally. By having a team on the ground in Vietnam, we're able to navigate the opportunity and be nimble across uh, the company size and deliver out performance for our investors. Next slide. So the fund is listed on the main board of the London Stock Exchange. Uh, so red, easy to, to trade and we provide a, a daily estimate of NAV. Next slide. We're always open to receive uh, feedback or, or questions. Uh, we're very transparent uh, as a fund. Um, we thank you very much for listening to our presentation. And now we have the opportunity for some Q&A.